hey guys, before we get into this episode of the Preacher Boys podcast, I want to share about something that really resonates with me. This show is sponsored by Free Lunch Coffee. Now, many of you might not know this, but before I was a podcaster, I was actually a missionary working with an orphanage directly in India. And one of the things I was really passionate about was just making sure that the day-to-day needs of these kids were met so they could focus on their school, focus on just living a happy and fulfilled life. And Free Lunch Coffee is on a mission to do the exact same thing. Free Lunch Coffee is on a mission to end child hunger from this world. When a child doesn't have to worry about their next meal, they can focus on improving their natural gifts and talents to make a real difference in this world. And I want to let you guys know something really cool. With every bag of coffee you buy from Free Lunch Coffee, you're supporting a child to get a meal for two weeks. That's right. One bag of coffee buys a meal for a kid for two weeks. Free Lunch Coffee gives away 50% of the money they make to end hunger from the lives of underprivileged children. Their coffee is specialty grade, certified organic. I know my wife will like that. And fair trade. They offer a 100% money back guarantee for 30 days, so you don't have any risk involved whatsoever. They're also offering a 10% discount to the listeners of this podcast. That's right. If you listen to the Preach Voice podcast, you're getting 10% off of your order from Free Lunch Coffee, which is also going to help pay for a child's meal for two weeks. Listen, all you have to do, use the coupon code PREACHERBOYS. That's capital P-R-E-A-C-H-E-R BOYS. Preacher Boys. And check out freelunchcoffee.com today. Start ordering and start helping a child in need. All right, guys, with that said, let's get into today's episode. Before we get back into the episode, I want to talk about my sponsor, Gobble. Now, look, I love podcasting. I love getting to sit on interviews all day, edit episodes, release content, but the reality is it makes it really easy to rely on just food delivery services or getting, you know, gross takeout or fast food and uh, just real life happens and gets in the way. And no matter how good your intentions are to eat better, to cut back on takeout, real life happens, especially right now where even going to the grocery store can be a little bit stressful. So if you want to create a healthy meal routine that's personalized for your busy lifestyle, I've got a great deal for you to get started. With Gobble, no matter how crazy your schedule is, you can get a nutritious, flavorful, homemade dinner on the table that only takes 15 minutes to make. There's no menu planning, no shopping, or tons of difficult prep time. They pre-portion and prep the fresh ingredients like chopping up vegetables, creating spice blends, and simmering the perfect sauces. Just pick from the dinner menu each week with a variety of flavors, classic dishes, global recipes, delicious vegetarian options, plus a line of lean and clean recipes featuring low-calorie or low-carb options like me and my wife always try to hit. You'll find more than just dinner with weekly menu options like breakfast, soups, salads, even desserts. You name it. And the Gobble Box is delivered fresh right to your doorstep. It's so easy. Plus, it's flexible and there isn't a big commitment. You can skip delivery weeks or cancel the service at any time. And listen, right now for my listeners, they're offering a limited time deal where you can get six meals for just $36. That's right. Six meals for $36 plus free shipping. That's dinner for two for three nights for just $36. It's available right now if you go to gobble.com slash preacherboys. That's right. Go to gobble.com slash preacherboys to get six meals for just $36. It's a no-brainer, guys. Take advantage. All right. Now let's get back into the show. I'm going to tell you what. The, the reason that these news stories are coming out today about churches, and then there have been some stories on big-name networks about uh, abuse inside the IFB, uh, Independent Baptist Churches. And I say this right. to my people. It would have been handled. It would have never got there. The world is is in yeah. some in regard to God allowing the world to judge us because we won't judge ourselves. And so, if everybody would have done what we should have done, we should have called the authorities first. We should have dealt with it strong as a church. It would have never made it to the news because it would have been handled. And shame on us for ever letting it get there. And trust me, Eric, I'm gonna say this to you, okay? There's a lot of people probably, there's a lot of pastors that listen probably to broadcasts like yours or podcasts like yours and other podcasts that are saying stuff. And we're nodding our head up and down saying, yeah, you're right. This, some of this stuff needs to be, needs to be addressed strong and hard. And we're really not adversarial towards you because again, what you're exposing does not threaten us at all. Trigger warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. 
You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. To find more information about the Preacher Boys podcast and upcoming documentary, visit PreacherBoysDoc.com or connect on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at PreacherBoysDoc. Now, here is your host... Eric Skwarzynski. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Preacher Boys podcast. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining me on the show. I know we've talked quite a bit off air, but I'd love to get to talk with you just a little bit more about this. But before we get started, can you just introduce yourself and let my audience know just a little bit about you? Oh, absolutely. Thank you, first of all, Eric, for allowing me to come on. My name is Michael Poindexter. I have the privilege of pastoring the Lighthouse Baptist Church here in Seagrove, North Carolina. And uh, the short version of my story, born and raised here in the very county I pastor in, which was, you know, surprised to me as far as I didn't think the Lord would lead me close to home. He chose to, but I, I actually was born here and I grew up most of my life in the area in a Southern Baptist church most of my life, ended up uh, marrying and moving about 30 minutes away, got saved in my wife's home church, which was also a Southern Baptist church. And I came out of that about six to eight months after my conversion, ended up getting set in the Independent Baptist Church and eventually spent several years there serving and then really felt called to come back to my hometown of all places and plant a church. And so we did that, and I've been pastoring that same church for the last 15 years. I'm married to the love of my life, and the Lord's given us five uh, wonderful children, and we were busy, blessed, and excited. Yeah, you're definitely busy with five kids. I'm busy with one. So you said something interesting. So you said you were saved at a Southern Baptist church, but people can't get saved in Southern Baptist churches, can they? <laughs> yeah, absolutely they can. As a matter of fact, anywhere the gospel's preached, uh, you better believe that the gospel's the power of God and the salvation. Yeah. That's where the power is at. It's not on the title of the sign. It's in the message of the gospel. And, yeah, the gospel seed was both planted and watered in my heart from a very young age in the Southern Baptist Church, and uh, to which I'm very thankful for. And uh, I'm very grateful as well that church is still there preaching the gospel today and uh, and doing a work for Christ. Uh, I, I am curious. So you, you mentioned you went from... You went to two different Southern Baptist churches and then eventually ended up at an independent Baptist church. What what was the reason for the move there? Was it mainly that like doctrinal? Did it just happen to be an independent Baptist church? What what was the reason for the change there? It's a great question. After I got saved, of course, I just started immersing myself in the Word of God and I started getting hold of different kinds of preaching and and some more excitable. And I guess maybe I was young when I got saved. I was in my early 20s. And I started seeing things from the Bible. And I think what really probably spurned me initially to walk away from the Southern Baptist Church was when I got saved, the Sunday morning I got saved, there was an associational missionary that was passing through that preached the gospel that morning particularly. And But afterwards, we were actually in between pastors. And so I got saved, joined the church. And and so the church was looking and what I noticed was that there was a lot of uh, staunch traditionalism that really held the church back from going forward. It was very mechanical in that regard. And and right. so I just really got frustrated at the process. And what happened was this. We had a younger man, and I say young, he was probably in his late, late 20s, early 30s, that had been preaching for the church. And he, the Lord really seemed to be blessing him as he preached, and the church really started coming alive. And and he wasn't quite, I guess you could say, dyed in the wool enough for their taste. And so they, they wouldn't even right. give him a C or a chance. And so that kind of frustrated me as a young convert. So I felt that too much tradition, too much thing, too many things were tied down too tightly. God couldn't really work. Right. And it was, that was a young a convert's opinion. So that's what caused me to walk away. It's pretty amazing you've been at the church you're at now for so long. And that's rare, just pastoring in general, that a pastor stays at a church that long. So I commend you for that. That's a That's huge. But yeah, I definitely want to dive in. So the reason that we set up this call is was because you actually do a podcast yourself called the Higher Grounds Podcast. And there was a series you guys did, a two episode series talking about people who leave the independent Baptist movement. And I saw it. I know a lot of other people saw it and had some had some concerns with some things that were said. And there was 
I'm just of the personality, and I know from talking to you off air uh, that you have the personality of when you have a disagreement, it's good to get on the phone and talk a little bit. And so I got to talk with you a little bit. I got to talk with Andy uh, Wells a little bit, who's also on the show. And I, I think I understand a lot of where you guys are coming from. I think we may still have a lot of disagreements too, but I just wanted to bring you on specifically to talk about that episode and some of the statements that were made and just to get clarity because at the end of the day, even if people are still bothered by what you said, I want them to be bothered by what you said and not what they think you were trying to say. And so I just want to get some clarity and hope we can have a good, kind discussion and walk away with a better understanding of each other. But yeah, I'd love to dive into the episode. I do believe that uh, there were some things that were read into, uh, maybe you know, have, having to be assumed, but you're going to give me a chance to clarify, which I, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely want to I definitely want to do that. And I know from talking with both you and with Andy Wells, which I won't talk too much about our side conversation, but I do know that you guys are not OK with abuse. And so if I thought or had an inkling that you were, I wouldn't be on the podcast. But I definitely think that there's a lot to unpack. And I think especially in the second episode you guys put out, I'm going to really focus in there where you started really addressing the issues that are being talked about by whatever you want to call them, survivors, ex-members, fill in the blank there. But one of the first accusations that you guys talked about was referring to the independent Baptist movement as a cult. I would love to at least cover the first issue Go that ahead. they say is a reason why sure. people should abandon independent fundamental Baptist ahead, churches. The first one is that they have went to the extent, some have, of calling fundamentalism a cult, <laughs> which we hear a lot about that in our day. There's been a lot of good documentary type mm -hmm. work done on cults and things like that. And uh, so what I want to do is just bring out the definition, talk about it for a few minutes sure. and mm -hmm. see if Go we ahead. feel like there's any validity to what they're saying. The definition of the word cult is simply this, a system of religious veneration and devotion directed toward a particular figure or object, okay? Now, I don't know about you, and I understand, I understand that there are some sub-segments of fundamentalism who seem to have a high regard of worship toward an individual. Not going to deny that. Not my crowd, but not going to deny that. But ultimately, the figure that I find independent Baptist in love with, mm -hmm. fundamentalist, right. is the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. By love, and large. Absolutely. Love the Lord Jesus. I would say this. If you're in a church or in, in part of a group of people where you hear the name of a dead preacher more than you do the name of the Lord Jesus, you probably should move on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. That would scare me to death. But the guys I run with, yeah. the, the independent Baptists I know, and the different ones that I'm associated with or whatever or would align with, man, they're going to they're gonna exalt the Savior. Yeah. I'll just go out and say, I don't believe the denomination as a whole is a cult, but I do think that there are a lot of churches that act in a cultish way. Would, would you agree with that statement? I don't have a problem with you making that statement. We defined it on the, on the clip or on the episode from a, just a basic dictionary definition. And, and I think the way it come across was, or the way it was defined as, a cult's a system of religious veneration and devotion directed toward a particular figure or object. And, and I think probably when you say that, uh, that you see some of those tendencies, you probably have some specific places in mind. Is that probably a, a fair assessment? Right. Yeah, I definitely say specific places. I would even go so far as to say specific factions of the IFB. Like I would say there's a lot in certain camps where I would say entire camps of the IFB would fall into that realm. And, and just for, again, defi definitions matter, like where I approach the topic of cult, I tend to reference Stephen Hassan. He has something called the bite model where he defines abusive leadership versus normal, healthy leadership, abusive community versus healthy community. And so he breaks down really the differences between a, high, a harmful organization and one that is non-harmful and is actually helpful. And, and just to just for context, I'll, I'll read a couple of those. One of the things that they talk about is in a healthy for healthy individuals, there's authentic self, unconditional love, uh, a conscience, there's free will and critical thinking in an unhealthy environment. There's a cult identity. You have you operate out of fear and guilt and there's dependency and obedience to the organization that you're serving under for leaders. Uh, unhealthy would be would be uh, narcissistic or psychopathic, being elitist or power hungry, claiming absolute authority, whereas healthy would be accountable, empowering individuals and knowing their own limits. And then for an organization, it would be 
uh, unhealthy would be deceptive or manipulative, cloning people, ends justify means, preserving its own power, and there's no legitimate reason to leave the organization. Whereas a, a healthy organization would have informed consent, checks and balances, you're free to leave, it encourages your personal growth and not necessarily just conformity. So when I say cultish, I'm usually referencing that. Is it a place where you can ask questions, where you can leave and still be considered a good person or, or even be considered a Christian? Because in some IFB churches, the preaching can lean into the idea that if you're not IFB, are you even saved? You know, so I just want to make that distinction there, whether it's when I say cult, I don't mean robes and candles and, you know, all the things that people might think of. I'm thinking healthy leadership versus unhealthy. And, and when you rephrase the question, it makes better sense because religiously right. speaking, cults are Jim Jones, David Koresh, Marshall, exactly. Apple White. Right. Or, yeah. So in that regard, no. But on the, uh, if you when you define it in that way, I know exactly what you're talking about. And, yeah. and basically what you just described is that and there are guys out there who they are so insecure uh, and probably more than anything so under conviction about their lack of Christ-like leadership that they have mm. to make the, their church – as if it is uh, is superior and uh, basically right. say things that, that make people feel like I can't leave here or I shouldn't leave here. And, and without going into, you know, gross detail, because I know this wasn't part of what we um, originally talked about maybe entertaining on the podcast, I had a brush with that uh, in my time, early days, mm-hmm. uh, being an independent Baptist. And so I know quite a bit about that. And so, yeah, I say that does exist out there. Now, on, a, on the other side of that, I know me personally – the people that I pastor, I tell them this. I say, hey, look, where you go to church at, you should be happy there. Because I think happy Christians are the greatest advertisements for your church out in the community when they're excited about where they go to church, they're enthusiastic about their walk with God. Those are great witnessing tools. And matter of fact, I tell my folks in half for years, if you find yourself not happy, then you should go find happiness. Right. And there's no effort put into guilting them or manipulating them to stay. I, I, when people call me from time to time, and this happens, and I say this, look, sometimes people just they just get stagnant where they're at, and a change would be good for them. But when folks yeah. call me and say, hey, look, we've decided to move on, there, a lot of times I don't even ask a reason. And the reason I don't yeah. because I believe in soul liberty, and I believe in the priesthood of the believer, and, and, and even if they're making a mistake, then that'll have to be on them because they should be walking with the Lord enough to be able to make that decision. And so I I try to create an environment in the church that I pastor, and I hope a lot of other guys do too, to where, hey, look, they're out of their own free will. (laughs) You know what I mean? And and they know because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. There's not bondage and tying you down. I will say this, what you described earlier does exist because I've seen it firsthand. I've experienced it some. And yeah, I would say that is real. And I say that comes from guys who are extremely insecure. I'd agree with you there. Yeah, it's a lot of the, and I think I talked with Stacey Shifflett about this on the podcast. When you have singular leadership, when you have a pastor leading a church, that structure can be a positive thing if you have a positive leader, but you, it, it does allow itself to be open to having someone step behind the pulpit who maybe is in it for themselves. And if you don't have any kind of accountability or any kind of security there, it can get off the rails pretty quick. And I think we've both seen that happen in in different churches. So you mentioned on the, you guys mentioned on the show, and I'm I'm just curious if this is the perception, but I I don't remember if it was you or Andy had brought up that a lot of people who leave IFB churches believe that all IFB churches need to go. There are some guys that evidently have not had what they consider to be a positive experience with independent fundamental Baptist churches and got a little bit of a burr under their saddle. Mm -hmm. I think so. It is a proper way to, and there's a back reason I say that, Uh a little burr under their saddle. And and I, I hate to come out a little harsh here, but not quite spiritually mature enough yeah, uh, or spiritual enough to be able to coexist inside the body of Christ, like mm-hmm. a Paul and a Barnabas, sure. or even a Paul and Peter, who had disagreements, and not make it your life's mission to destroy that individual. I think that's where, for me, that I've listened to their arguments. I've read some books 
about the subject matter. And I'm just not seeing nor understanding the purpose. Again, Mm -hmm. to set out to seek to call for others to abandon, to seek to destroy, Mm -hmm. undermine, and even really paint in a picture of some group of people that in reality is not quite accurate. It's not quite true. Can you expand on that a little bit? And and do you guys feel like that's the perception when you're listening to, say, shows like mine or to people who are speaking out about wrongdoing within that movement? Sure. No, I, I don't I don't necessarily think that it's because that, that folks are pointing out some areas that need addressing. And I'll tell you what, when I made that statement, when our podcast aired, I hadn't heard anyone yet speak as if there were good independent Baptist churches. I do believe that has started to come out more and more. And I'm not going to say it's because I said that or anything like that. I think maybe what's happening is uh, some of the podcasts that are aimed at pointing out issues inside the independent Baptist has caused more guys who I I think are more probably from the, the, the line of thinking that I'm in to come to the forefront and maybe introduce themselves to guys like you and other guys that have platforms like yours. And hopefully it's bringing more light and to balance to the idea that, hey, look, there are a lot of guys, because I'll say this, um, I'll say this, Eric, a lot of the things you guys are talking about from on your side from the abuse and then on other guys' positions from just sometimes the craziness, there are guys like me and a lot of other guys, unknown, we, we're from small towns, we don't have a big name, we pastor in small areas, but we are guys who have been preaching about and talking about this stuff a lot. And so for me, when I felt like when I started hearing it, when a lot of times what I was hearing was the IFB, the IFB. Of course, that's the umbrella I fall under. So right. I started listening. And here was my thing, okay? If the the IFB, like any other area or denomination, we've got issues. And we're trying to, I'm trying to address it, me personally, from where I'm at, doing my part, trying to, and encourage other guys around me to do the same. But to, to say, as, as what I took it at in the beginning with some of the things I was hearing and reading, um, to say it, it was almost so far gone, it was irredeemable. I, I thought it was a stretch when you consider where Israel got to a few times and the Lord never right. gave up on them. And, and when you get to Revelation, you find out that five of the seven churches is addressed with problems and repentance is offered. And then even if yeah, the Lord said, hey, if any man would just hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and sup with him. And so I just that's where I – and I'll be honest with you. Here's the thing about it. Long before there was Voice Podcast or even others that I have recently learned about, I started reading about these things and studying about them years ago. And I'll even go, I'll date this a little bit. You remember probably there was a blog that was started years ago called Stuff Bundy's Like. I started reading that back uh, years back, and I think it, I think it almost kind of come to a stop. I think he, whoever runs it quit yeah. posting. But what used to frustrate me so bad, Eric, was that there would be issues brought up on there, and I'm like, man, that's legit. I hope somebody will speak to that in a scriptural way. And then it always turned to, like, satire and mocking, and I'm like, man, nobody that really is searching for truth is going to hang around for just all this silliness. If you're going to bring something up, address it from the Bible, and let's move the needle toward truth. You know, I mean, that was where I was at. This is not something that just happened in my life or my world in the last 8, 10, 12 months. This is something I've been sure. looking at for a long time. Yeah, no, there's been, yeah, stuff funny like was definitely had a huge had a huge reach in its heyday. And I've had a lot of pastors who, I think people would be surprised how many IFP pastors I've gotten to speak to in the past couple months. And I had a pastor reach out to me and he, just a few weeks ago, and we said, I'm premillennial, I'm King James only, and listed off like 20 different things really quick. And he said, but I hate abuse. And I told him when we got off the call and when he first said that, I said, you're never gonna be featured on my podcast for being any of the things you just said. The only way to get a feature on the podcast is abuse. And I know many good people who have very strict standards, who they their wife would never wear pants because she feels like that's wrong, or he goes to soul winning every Saturday or whatever thing that you would link to that. And I'm not frustrated with that stuff. Are there certain things that you know, aren't for me or my family? Sure, but I'm not gonna spend my time focusing on those when there's much bigger issues at, at play there. So I, I do, that's one area I agree with you very strongly on, is I think that sometimes, while while places like Stuff Funny's like really had a, a good impact in bringing awareness to some things, I think the overall target gets missed sometimes when we focus on memes and gifts and jokes. 
we just mentioned abuse. So I just want to dive into that conversation that you guys had because you really hit three things. You hit the sexual, the mental, and the spiritual abuse. Now, obviously my show is specifically focused primarily on sexual abuse. It does get into both the physical, mental, and spiritual as well. But you guys all said you're against sexual abuse. And the statement that was made was that it was up to the local body to deal with those things expeditiously. We are 100% against and condemn uh, any kind of sexual abuse. Sure. We believe there are really are victims of sexual abuse. Absolutely. It's egregious. We believe it's right. bi- biblically disqualifying. Right. It should be handled firmly from the scriptures. And it's up to that local body, if they want to remain in good standings, mm-hmm. we believe with God, to deal with those things right. exponentially. Yeah. Okay. Right. That statement was said and I may agree or may disagree, but I'm just curious, how is the local body to deal with abuse? That's a great question. I would say this. First of all, I think, especially in the day and time we're living in, I think our pulpits have got to speak up and speak out about abuse. And what I mean by that is this, is there's, there could be victims sitting in our own churches experiencing, and they don't realize how wrong it is, and even if it's in their own family. So I think the pulpit's mm-hmm. got to take some preemptive work done there. And okay. then uh, after we start speaking up, I think secondly, we've got to create a culture that's very unattractive to pedophiles. And what I mean by that is this right here. Churches are always expected to be nice, and we're supposed to be like Christ yeah. and this, that, and the other. We're also pastors are called to protect the flock. And so I think, and here's what we do at our church. Uh, there's never a time whenever an adult is alone with a child. I require two adults in every classroom setting, anything working with any child, whether it's a church kid or a kid brought in on the bus, whatever. If you're going to work with children in our church, we're going to have federal and state background checks um, done on you. If you don't, if you don't submit to that, then you're just not going to work in our children's program. And then anything that I see that remotely makes me uncomfortable, it's a one strike and you're out kind of deal. And there's not going to be a second chance. Now, you get there. Let's just say that abuse has taken place. First thing that needs to happen is the authorities must be notified immediately. That's a criminal situation. And the reason it's becoming more and more common. There's a lot of states now that even can a pastor can be charged uh, criminally yeah. himself if he knows stuff and he's not reporting it. And so, you know, and I think all states are required. I think pastors, uh, sometimes you're, you get some real sensitive information and you need to pass that along. Let's you and, and I'll use this as an example of how churches should should, should handle stuff. You mentioned Stacy Shiflett, uh, who is a personal friend. I preach for Brother Stacy. He preaches for me. Matter of fact, I'm actually a, a counselor. Me and my wife are on his No More Cover Ups website. We have been from the beginning, and he handled his situation in a textbook manner. And here's what I mean: He got information. The abuser was already gone, and so he took the information he got and he acted on it. He didn't sweep it under the rug. He didn't hide it. And he acted on it. He brought it out before his church. He told his church what was going on or what had happened. Uh, he got the authorities involved. And then, and then he went after it. And so I think that is the position a shepherd, a pastor, should take. It's flock. It's always the protection and, and the uh, standing for whoever has been harmed or hurt. Let me say this to you, Eric. I have no, nothing in my call tells me to protect the shield of the independent Baptist or to try to keep a movement alive. I am called to preach the gospel, to honor the Lord Jesus, and in no way, shape, or form am I, do my allegiances lie anywhere else first. You know what I'm saying? And so it does not matter to me who's on the other end of that charge. you got to handle it that way. One thing I think I, I was a little bit encouraged about was when I looked at your abuser database and I saw all the independent bad situations you were documenting, I saw it looked like a high number of them where authorities had been involved. Several of them yeah. had people that already were convicted and incarcerated, and some of the cases, of course, hadn't come to fruition yet. But my thing is this, the, the long arm of the law needs to come down on that person. And then on top of that, the church should take a biblical position and, and hold them accountable biblically. And these guys should be put out of the ministry permanently. You and I know this, is that there has in days gone by, and it still even happens today probably, where guys have just been shifted off to another state. And, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you biblically, Eric, where that gets down to, because you asked me this, what should a church do? The Bible teaches us clearly in 1 Timothy 5.20 that them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. 
Now, I've heard pastors misuse that verse or that passage and say that's talking about a preacher's right to rebuke sin in the church publicly. That is not true. That is talking about the sin of an elder being made public before others. Now, why would the Lord say to do that? He said to do that because of this. If we start exposing these guys like you're doing, then other guys that are thinking about it or flirting with it or getting close to the edge will get scared, hopefully, and back away. So that's a measure of protection for people. Now, here's the next level to that because this gets – you're getting close to the heart of things I've preached for years when you talk about this stuff. In, in, in the very next verse 21 of 1 Timothy 5, it says this, that you're to do nothing by partiality, okay? So in other words, if, if that person that gets caught is a family member of mine, if they're a friend of mine in the ministry, I treat them the same way as if I never knew them. If they were a preacher across the country whose name I wasn't even familiar with, I, justice should be blind in the church. It shouldn't matter who it is. And I should treat them all the same. Now, the third layer of this is in the very next verse 22. When it says, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. Here's where I stand, Eric. For a preacher who who covers up abuse for a friend in the ministry, he has now become a partaker of that man's sins. And in my opinion, by the scriptures, that church he pastors now has the right to dismiss him. I was given this information, and I've not been able to validate it, but they say that while a certain pastor committed an abuse in the last, I don't know, five to eight years, where he took a girl across state lines, underage girl, for sex, and um, it was found out he's now in prison. But they say that there was up to 130-plus pastors that wrote letters of commendation for him to be read in court. If I'm a member of one of those churches and my pastor just vouched for a man who was guilty of sexually abusing a young lady, one of two things is happening. Either I'm leaving and I'm going to make known why I'm leaving, and or our men, our deacons, whatever the structure is going to do the right thing and dismiss him because he has violated his position in uh, condoning and uh, laying hands of approval on a man that is not pure. That's what was shocking to me. And it was actually the, the genesis of this show was Sarah Jackson and Cameron Giovanelli and that situation. And when Cameron was had literally confessed to doing all of these acts, there were still, there was a pastor that sent out on church letterhead to his mailing list to send money to help pay for his legal fees. And when you see something like that happen and it just goes unchecked, it can, it's, it's incredibly frustrating because the church, and I don't mean church big C, but when church little C, when you see a church standing on the side of the abuser and not the abused, it's no longer a church. And so you say you're, you're independent and Baptist. You don't necessarily align with the movement, but, but would you say that there is like an, there is a similarity that all of these churches tend to share. And there is a group mentality, like independent Baptists do operate in many ways as an organization, even though they don't have a, a specific hierarchy. Would you agree with that? Or would you say that all IFB churches are pretty much completely independent and should be dealt with in an independent way? No, I think I see what your, where your, where your question is. I say this, okay, uh, there are some denominations where there is a conventional structure. And uh, right. Southern Baptist, so I understood we had county, we had a county association, and then there was a, the larger scale association and so forth and so on. And uh, you sent delegates uh, to the convention and things were voted upon that represented the group. In the independent Baptist world, here's how it shakes down. And this is one thing that, that a lot of people understand. The Southern Baptist, really, every congregation is still self-governing. There, there's, not a, there's not a power structure in the Southern Baptist where someone from the top tells the other guys right. what to do. I get that because I grew up in it. Now, in the independent Baptist world, here's what usually connects us. There's going to be a few things. Number one, and, and you've talked about this before probably, it'll be the college that you went to. You can form, right. you can form a larger scale group there. It'll be something like maybe uh, sometimes it's even the, the youth camps that your kids go to starts forming the, 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 the tentacles of more association for different circles that you run with, people you preach for. I think inside of fundamentalism or the independent Baptist world, I think it's very fragmented. And, and I think those are uh, lightning rods, the things I just mentioned, that can start forming groups. And that's how our missionaries know who do I go to, who, who do I call whenever, I, whenever the Lord right. calls me into missions. Usually you get a mailing list of whoever, if you're, say you went to a certain Bible college 
and a couple guys in there. Well, a lot of the guys on that list is probably going to be connected to that school. If you're in the South, yeah. and it may not be as much to a Bible college, maybe more to like a camp meeting, or there is usually a hub that connects several of those congregations together. That's how it works in the IFB world, in my opinion. I, I know some people I talk to are like, no, it's completely independent. I'm like, I grew up in it, and I I was I worked with a missions organization for for some time in it. And there's definite camps. I think there are guys. Uh, this was something that interested me when I talked to um, Andy Wells. Was they talked about my dad just started a church, and he was truly he he didn't come born out of a movement. He just happened to meet a lot of the same things that they did, and he was a truly unaffiliated church. But I also I also think that. The people who I tend to be speaking to when I talk about abuse and cover up tends to be those that are completely loyal to, like you said, a, a certain college. I mentioned Hiles Anderson, like there's definitely a network there, people in different camp meetings. And I guess my question to you would be, uh, look, not you. I, I know that you're saying you're an unaffiliated church, like you really operate completely independently of outside sources. But would you say that the majority of independent Baptist churches would agree with the statements you've made about how to handle sexual abuse? Or do you feel like there's the majority would say, oh, we don't like abuse and we would put out anybody who does? Or do you think that there is a network of churches that do pass around all of these pedophiles or rapists or fill in the blank? That's a tremendous question. And I'm going to answer it. And I'm going to answer it probably with a little bit of a different flair. I've not okay. done enough conversation or, or relating with guys or talking to guys that to know the true dynamic of that. But I'll say this. There is no doubt there's too many stories of guys either getting passed on to other ministries and abuse being kept in house for me to act. I know that exists. And it, it's a tragedy that it does. And, and the more – here's the thing about it, Eric. What you are doing does not scare guys like me at all. Because you're, right. you're, it, this abuse stuff, it, it, it gives anybody remotely connected with it a bad name. So since it's not who I am and it's not who the guys I run with are, and we hate it. And so we're glad that it's yeah. getting more attention. We're hoping this helps stomp it out because we don't right. want the black eye from it. And I'll be honest with you, I feel like my generation spends a lot of time answering, sometimes even for the ministries of dead men, which right. is why I, I – we want to rewrite our own story the right way. Now, to not want to, I don't want to shy away from your question. I know what you're talking about is real. It exists. And so, therefore, yeah, I, I think it's a problem. And, I'm again, I'm, I think the, I hope the next generation, which includes me, I really hope we dive back to the book and say, look, it's not okay. It does not hurt the cause of Christ to treat it right and expose it. The only thing that hurts the cause of Christ, here's my thing. I told my church this. I'm going to tell you what, the, the reason that these news stories are coming out today about churches, and then there have been some stories on big name networks about uh, abuse inside the IFB, uh, independent Baptist churches. And I say this right. to my people, it would have been handled, it would have never got there. The world is, is in yeah. some in regard, God allowing the world to judge us because we won't judge ourselves. And so if yeah. everybody would have done what we should have done, we should have called the authorities first. We should have dealt with it strong as a church. It would have never made it to the news because it would have been handled. And shame on us for ever letting it get there. And trust me, Eric, I'm going to say this to you, okay? There's a lot of people probably, there's a lot of pastors that listen probably to broadcasts like yours or podcasts like yours and other podcasts that are saying stuff. And we're nodding our head up and down saying, yeah, you're right. This, some of this stuff needs to be, needs to be addressed strong and hard. And we're really not adversarial towards you because again, what you're exposing does not threaten us at all. No, that's awesome. And again, like that's where I just hope, again, I know that there's pastors who probably listen to the show who would never reach out or would never tell anybody they listen to the show. But right. I, I, I know that there's many listening. And uh, time and again, I try to say, I'm not here to shut down every church that bears the name Independent Federal Baptist. I, I have friends that pastor churches that meet that criteria. But I think it really comes down to if you are someone who is thinking about covering abuse, if you are someone who is abusing, then yeah, the minute I find out, like it's gonna go out because that's what needs to happen. But guys like you, guys like uh, Andy and other people I've talked to that may may worship differently or wear different clothes or have different order of service or fill in the blank, I could care less because at the end of the day, 
that's how you're operating your church. And as long as you're, you know, we can get into the theological side and all that on it in a different conversation. But I think at the end of the day that I just want the church to be a safe place. And for too many, regardless of whether it's systemic, which we'll get into it or not, for too many places, it hasn't been a safe place for children or for women or for, for anyone for that matter. So we, we talked a little bit about the sexual abuse. I, I want to get into mental abuse. I don't have a ton to hit on here, but I am curious because this is where abuse becomes a gray area. I think in some ways there are definite things that are mentally or spiritually abusive, but there's also seems to be when someone cites mental abuse in the church, a lot of times independent Baptist pastors will say, oh, that's because you can't handle quote unquote hard preaching or, oh, they don't like that we hurt their feelings or we preached on sin. A lot of what I'm hearing them talk about is they feel like that when preaching is firm, mm-hmm. painting one in a box of meaning, okay, here's what the, thus said the Lord. And whenever Joshua makes the statement, choose you this day, mm-hmm. that there is a form of mental abuse taking place. They don't like the fact that a preacher says, this is what the word of God says, or these are principles that should be present in our lives. And if you're not, if you're not willing to walk in this way, then you're not willing to pay the price to walk with God. Those, oh, yeah. They feel like it's mentally abusive. And they say that people are just being crippled because of the expectations and the weight that independent Baptist churches put on them. But I think that's brushing it off in a way where it misses a lot of the real issues. So mental abuse, when I hear people talk to it about, talk to me about it is holding over this merit system over someone's head of you're accepted. If you do this many ministries or you're not truly serving God till you're putting in more than 40 hours a week or pushing these things that really put someone under the thumb of a leader. IFB Sermon Clips posted a sermon from Jack Treber where he says leadership needs to be unquestioned. I I think when you guys talked about it, it was an aside, but I'm curious, do you think mental abuse is a problem in a lot of churches or do you think it is something where it's more on the side of the person who perceives there's some kind of mental abuse happening? I think that question probably has two answers. Number one, I think this, I think that there are some very unhealthy church cultures out there, and and I'm talking about in independent Baptist circles. And those church cultures are the kind that really make people feel like that if you're not at the church six and seven days a week, your heart's not completely sold out to God. And if you don't wear 27 hats around the church, and if you don't work in every ministry, it, it's an exhausting it's an exhausting race. There's probably little to no enjoyment, and we, I believe well, we see a lot of casualties in independent Baptist uh, churches because of that. Uh, we, there's a lot of marriages that are really suffering. Uh, they're not healthy, and they can't say a word about it because it'll be deemed as unspiritual. Um, they just need to love God more and craziness like that. I, I totally get what you're talking about, and it does exist. And so I believe that can be mentally overtaxing uh, on somebody. I, I do. And then on the other side of that, there are some people that they're that they're going, and I think I probably said something about the burn of the saddle on the podcast that really was a trigger. He flipped some people out, but there are some people who who they just genuinely there's a certain they're not, they don't have they don't have any kind of encouragement or any kind of challenge to do more than what they're doing. And when I say that, I'm talking about somebody who probably is just darkening the doors is all they're doing. And here's right. the thing about it: the church as a whole. We're supposed to be involved in the work of the ministry in some capacity. I know how I pastor is this. I, I watch my people, and I got people that would wear every hat I would let them wear, and I don't let them wear so many hats because I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to overtax them. I'm not going to overdrive them, and they get frustrated with me sometimes because if I mention something else that you know is a possibility to reach more people, they're going to sign up for it if I let them, and I won't. So the culture you're talking about does exist, and you just hope and pray for people that they figure out who they are in Christ, number one. Realize this, that he made this statement. He said, my yoke is easy, my burden's light. 
And so, in other words, if I'm being driven to the point of mental, spiritual, and physical exhaustion, I'm not being driven to that by the Lord, probably. Though I know when Jesus was here, he did have a day like the dark ministry a lot of times, and he did. But you got to remember, he's here for three and a half years on his ministry, so he had to get the Father's work done. we got a lifetime, and this is not a sprint. It's, a mar- it's not a marathon. It's just more like a – it's a big race is what I'm trying to say. And so I do believe that. And I'll be honest with you, me and my wife have been privileged to do some marriage conferences and different things like that together. And and we've talked to some people who really, they wore out serving God. And it's not because they're not sold out. And it's not because they don't love the Lord. It's just because it's it's six days a week. And it's when I'm not on my job, i got to be doing something for the church. And I don't believe yeah. it's biblical. Yeah, you got to come aside and rest a while. And here's the thing about it. When God gave the structure of a week, there was one day every week you took off to rest and worship. Now, where we make a mistake, especially we preachers, and I don't want to be a hypocrite here, is we work ourselves to the bone for six months. We take one week off and say, okay, I've got my R&R, and, and, and that's, not, that's not right. Even we preachers should take a day of the week off. There have been some heroes, that, as, are, as they've been called by some in the independent Baptist world, that didn't preach and teach that. They taught what you're talking about, and it ruined the generation almost. So as far as this last area of spiritual abuse, and I, th- I think we touched on some of this, and I do want to be careful to delineate, like, there are some, it's true, there are some who would say that being asked to change anything or being taught that the Bible's the Word of God or any kind of doctrine would be abusive. I, I know I've talked to people who feel like that, and I, I would disagree with that sentiment. I think spiritual abuse, as I would define it, would be hanging some sort of carrot of God's approval on you if you do something. I I know in the environments I grew up in, it was the idea of God's, are you living in God's will? Which is a fine question, but when they start telling you what God's will is and dangling that in front of you. So if you go to Bible college, you'll be in God's will. If you get married to this person, you're in God's will. When, you know, God, I, I believe God gave us things that are certainly within his will, But I think he also gave us the Holy Spirit to determine what he's guiding us to do in our own personal life. I don't think everybody has the exact same thing that would put them inside of, quote unquote, God's. Would you agree with that? Or would you say that maybe a pastor should move people or push them in certain directions if they feel like it would be good for them? No, I do disagree with with. I know what you're talking about, some of the things you mentioned there. I'll say this. There's like a, there's a, there are some things that are generally the will of God for all believers. It praying and getting the word, getting fed, that's generalized. But here's one thing about the will of God, Eric, when it comes on an individual basis. And this is something that I do differ with a lot of guys that are independent Baptists. You won't find people in the Bible searching after the will of God. You'll find the will of God finding them. And you can go to Noah, you can go. Abraham, you can go to Paul, Peter. Jesus went to these people and revealed the will of God. So who am I to tell somebody, hey, the will of God for you has got to fall somewhere inside of this bubble? Because how many young men have been called to ministry by their pastor instead of by the Lord? And because right. of that, they get it all. They don't have a true calling from God. It's a it's an overburdensome weight. It kills them, crushes them. Many of them feel like a failure. They leave church forever. I don't even take my young people to these meetings where they preach the pass the mantle message because you're not putting something on these kids that God doesn't put on them. If God's big enough to find them and save them, if he wants them to do something like that, he will find them and he doesn't need your help. That's just the truth. And so I get enamored of that stuff against it. I preach messages to our people about things like that. And uh, and I influence, try to young people. I got five children. I've never one time mentioned ministry to my kids, and and none of my I got two my two oldest are in college now. Neither one of them are at Bible college. I didn't feel like they needed a year of Bible college to find the quote unquote will of God for their life. And the reason they didn't is because their mom and me have been putting the Bible in front of them since they were five years old or younger. Before that, with my wife, and they get Bible all the time. They don't need to go sit in a class. A lot of time, I'm gonna say something here that's gonna get me in trouble, but I've never cared. There's a lot of Christian schools and Bible colleges and pastors and even some churches that don't think anybody else has got enough sense to direct their children correctly but that, but those people. And so they overstep okay. their bounds. As a pastor, Eric, I don't have the right to overstep the bounds of a home. There, a husband has a, a measure of authority there. He's the priesthood of his home. I can't step over that father. I don't even I don't even counsel with young people in my church unless a parent comes to me and says, Hey, would you talk to my kid? 
Because I would be stepping in front of someone else's role, and I'm not going to do that. And so that's no, the culture that I that I hope other guys will start catching. And there are a lot of guys that, that would feel the same way if you interviewed them that I do. I'm not an anomaly by no means, but I'm just saying I I think there's some stuff, and we're just going to go back to the Bible. And we're going we're going to put things where they go. Just as we get near the end here, I want to talk a little bit about the issue of this being a systemic problem, and I, I think that's a term that trips people up because I think when you think systemic, you think there is this, you think of organizations that have a hierarchy and there's this institutional kind of cover up. But we talked a little bit about people being shuffled, there's camps, there's loyalty to different people. But you guys, you guys said that it being a systemic issue, you said basically that we didn't agree it was a systemic issue, that, that there's abuse that's in some churches, but not in most. And that a lot of the accounts that are talking about the stuff are featuring only like a handful of preachers. Have there been abuses in IFB churches? I guess. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. I mean, there has been. Uh, sure. There's no doubt. You not, the, not among anybody we really no, know, but not yeah. really. Yeah, there has been. But when you say it's in most, I say not even close. Right. You're a moron. I'm going to have to sound the horn and say there's absolutely no. Now, if you look at the Twitter feeds and you mm-hmm. look at the websites that are, their, their whole purpose uh, Some of the non websites yeah, well, that, yeah, yeah. that are smacking in the teeth stupidity. The Annans. And yes. they're out there and they're always featuring. They're dedicated to independent Baptist sermon clips and independent Baptist guys doing crazy stuff. What I would basically had to say would be this. You ever notice that there's usually only a handful of preachers they feature? Yeah, exactly. I, I would say less than 10. Oh, I would say for the most part they exist because here's my thing. When you feature those guys and then you turn around and say, yeah, this is how they are. This is the whole crowd. It's a systemic problem. They use that word loosely. It's a systemic problem. This is what I trial not. They say that independent Baptist churches in the area of abuse have systemic problems. Okay. Now, if you study the, the geographical uh, evidence or, or how many churches we have, say, just in America, mm-hmm. somewhere between 3,000 and 3,500. I believe last episode I tagged it at 3,500. Mm-hmm. But for numbers' sake, I would say, let's just say use 3,000. Nice round number, okay? Mm-hmm. All right. Can you, for these people that are screaming a systemic problem in the independent fundamental Baptist churches, can you name 30 pastors and churches in scandal? Mm. Okay. Wow. If you can, you have named 1% of who we are. Right. Hang on a second now. Okay. Say it again. If you can name 30 pastors and churches in scandal, abuse scandal, whether it be sexual, physical, whatever the case may be, Mm -hmm. you have successfully named that we have a 1% issue among independent (laughs) fundamental Baptist churches. Now, to get to 5%, you now have to name 150 pastors or independent Baptist churches in scandal. And even at 5%, it's not systemic. Mm-hmm. Right. You understand know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, but And so what we've got here is you've got guys blowing a horn for no reason at all. Not that you shouldn't point out the egregiousness of some of the areas. Right. Of the oh, yeah. Fine. Let's deal with it. We'll be on your side. We'll be yeah. blowing the horn with you. Mm-hmm. But the, the problem is not systemic. No. Here's the problem, okay? We now have a major problem in our educational system in America mm-hmm. with educators – committing impropriety with uh-huh. students. Where is the bannering call to shut down the educational system? Listen, not only that, but you have the same thing in corporate America. Absolutely. I mean, all the time. Just I mean, stealing money, insider trading, all mm-hmm. kinds of stuff. Where is the call from these great crusaders of truth mm-hmm. to shut down corporate America? It doesn't exist, okay? And, and look, I understand, the, I understand the call to shut down the Catholic Church. It's a political machine from the top down. Yeah, but it is absolutely infiltrated mm-hmm. with decades and decades. Absolutely. And it's, we're not talking about 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. We're talking about parishes around the country. We're talking about them having to pay Tens money. Tens of thousands Tens of, of thousands. Now, that oh, absolutely. is systemic. a systemic problem, yes, all right? Sir. With that being said, and we've we'll, we got to move along quickly here, but I think about this, okay? And they say, oh, we should leave, you should leave, you should leave. You should leave, okay? Let's just say, let's just give you an illustration. Let's just say, Brother Stephen, I love to eat at a certain chain restaurant. Mm-hmm. And we walk into a certain chain restaurant, and that restaurant we see on the wall has a D rating. Mm-hmm. Should I never go to that chain restaurant again? Mm-hmm. Or should I just go to the next town over and walk into that same chain restaurant where they've got an A rating oh, and yeah. eat there? That's where our churches are. Independent Baptist churches are the same. We're independent Baptists. That's going to tell you mostly what we believe doctrinally. Yes, sir. You may have bad leadership in a church, which gives it a D rating. Mm-hmm. Just like you might have bad management in a restaurant that gives it a D rating. 
but I'm not going over to something just called restaurant, or I'm not never eating at my favorite. Amen. I'm going to the one with the A yeah, rating. Good, Amen. Going Mike. down the road where they got good management, going down Amen. the road where they got good leadership, yes, and I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to walk with God, get fed from God's Word, and serve with that local body of independent Baptist believers Great. just like we are. Okay? Anybody got anything to say before we move to the last one? No, I, I just believe you're correct. The, the entire the entire uh, argument seems to me to be undefendable right. in a logical debate. It is. Absolutely. It is. It is. It don't make sense nowhere else. No. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question is, at what point does this get recognized as a significant problem where we can look at the actual structure of a lot of these churches and try to examine if something in that environment is contributing to abuse taking place? Yeah, when we made that statement, I think I was probably the one that made that statement on the podcast. I, I really, I was referring more to the non-accounts, I believe they're called, on, on social media. Right. And I was really talking about the whole, the, the preacher clips, the IB preacher clips thing, uh, which at that time, he, I wasn't really talking about your site. He had a limited number. We felt, I think he's changed that since then. I think he's featuring a lot more guys. I think he even got a little upset with us and tried to call us out over, over our podcast. He clipped some stuff of ours and, it was interesting because he, uh, later on he tried to call us out over a, he mentioned some names that he said were affiliated with abuse and asked why we didn't call these guys out. And I turned around and sent him a link to to uh, Andy done what was called a righteous rant. And he actually had called out right. a name or two of the guys he highlighted. So he jerks it down, and but he didn't give no retraction or apology. He was called out by another account over that. And it was funny because it's interesting. He says by him posting these clips of the IFB guys saying dumb things, it should produce repentance in them, which I agree. Yet when he yeah. said something that wasn't accurate, he didn't repent either. So that was tongue in cheek. Now right. I'll say this when it comes to the systemic stuff, okay? Think about this. Here's what I think. There are groups, because we talked about how fragmented we are as independent Baptists and how we get to our own circles that we run in. And there are right. groups where it seems to be heavily active or, or, more and more cases keep coming up inside of those circles. And so I think when you concentrate on those, and you're doing a lot of work now where you're calling names, you're hearing a, a victim story, and you're linking it back to the, the people who are involved, whether it be second level, third level, on down the line. I think the more that happens, Eric, the more it does start shining a light to particular, if you want to call them camps, and if those camps have systemic problems inside of them, the only way for that to, to, to really turn around is for light to be shown on it. And here's the thing I would like to say to you, okay? For guys that are looking to shine some light on some stuff and see some change, understand this, that change will always come from the inside out, not the outside in. So what the, the thing that I'm saying is this. It's valuable for you to be specific. And the reason it's valuable for you to be specific instead of broad is because the guys that are inside still, like myself, who see the things that you see and are already recognizing them and are against them, we start turning the dial in here and start seeing changes that really probably can't be affected from the outside. The, you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it makes sense in some ways, but I'm also curious, and, and maybe I'm just misunderstanding, but I look at organizations like, you look at organizations like SNAP that have made evoked a lot of change within, say, the Catholic Church, which I know you guys mentioned on the show, or organizations like Grace under Boz Chavidian. There are a lot of organizations that are shining a light from the outside. Do you think there's any place for that kind of thing or for any kind of outside, I guess, accountability or exposure of this sort of thing? Because I feel like putting these organizations, I guess, in a pressure cooker is going to it's going to either push people out or it's going to, one hopes, enact some kind of positive change within these kind of churches. Do you, do you think there is a place for, say, outside accounts or podcasts like Preacher Boys or Julie Roy's show, fill in the blank with names like that? Oh, yeah, I do. I do. I definitely think and if I articulate it any other way, I didn't mean to. I think that these things ultimately do put pressure, and I think that's a good thing. Again, like I said earlier, if we were doing our job, it wouldn't be as needed, you know what I'm saying? But because right. a lot of guys, are, there, there's a political system, uh, we know that, and, and that goes uh, for all different kinds of factions of every different denomination. I guess there's always a, a little bit of a political system, and some guys are slaves to it, so I don't I don't mind it at all. You know, the guys who say that this is hurting the cause of Christ, if it's taking a black eye, it's not the it's not the victim's fault, it's the abuser's fault. And it's our fault for not dealing hard with the abuser. 
I, I love what Stacy said in our interview where he talked about when you find out about a situation, you're a victim of circumstances. You found out something that you had no idea was going on. And it's what you do in the next step that <laughs> decides if you're going to be part of it or if you're going to be part of helping with the problem. And uh, he said it in a more articulate way than that. But I, I think that's Everyone's a victim of circumstances when they discover the problem, but it's your next steps that decide what part in the history of it you're going to play. I, I'm curious really quick, you mentioned Anon accounts, and I'm just curious to get your thoughts on that. Do you, you know, you just said, yeah, there's a place for shows like Preacher Boys, there's a place for people to shine a light on this stuff. But I'm curious how you feel about people doing it anonymously, because um, I know I have a lot of mixed emotions about and on accounts, but I'm curious to hear your position and if you think that there is a place for that and if you think that there's some benefit to that. Um, my thing would be this right here. Most likely, uh, we don't know who runs the, the account where the clips are posted, if it's a guy or girl, nobody knows, or at least I don't know. <laughs> but I would say this probably, why not put your name to it? What, what could you possibly have to lose? And the reason sure. I say that's because it's highly doubtful that you're into IFB anymore. But without knowing who it is, there's no context. And here's what I mean by that. We know this. Biblically, it's not wrong to judge. It, yeah. It's only it's, it's wrong to judge others when you have issues in your own life that are as bad, according to Matthew right. chapter 7, verse 1 through 6. So without a context of knowing who you are, then how do we know if you're not as bad or worse? So there's no – here's the thing about it. When you clip somebody – and and you're using their own words. There's not a lot of talk that can be said about that. Right. Uh, it is what it is. Now, sometimes the, the typing around it is kind of tries to frame a context that unless you heard the whole clip, you wouldn't know. So that's where I stand with it. I, I just think that if you if it really wanted to pack a punch, it, it needed to come from somewhere where you could look at it and say, this person is living what they're speaking out against, so therefore they have authority, or it, it just brings with it more weight, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a it's something I feel mixed about. Like you said, like sites, IFP preacher clips. I think it's harder for me to be upset with them because they are posting their own words, and a lot of the guys that are featured are saying really dumb stuff. And at that point, it's hard for me to say don't publish what they already put out publicly. But I do. I struggle because I've seen even and again, I'm not claiming responsibility for this, but I've seen a lot of anon accounts that are working to expose abuse, or which is a good mission. But especially when you come into the realm of accusation or when you're talking about like literal criminal topics, I think one thing I can say about the show that I'm proud of is that if a pastor was ever very upset that I shared a story or felt like I someone was wrongly accused on my show, it's not I'm two clicks away to contact and typically they can get on the phone with me pretty quickly. And I just think that's important. I, I Again, IFP Preacher Clips, and I've talked to them. I, I've had good conversations and, and things like that. I, Whatever. I, 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 I have a hard time being upset with the way that um, they go about it. But when it comes to accounts, especially dealing with accusing of cover-up or things like that, I think it is a responsibility. You guys said it this way, but to be man enough to put your name on it. And I think you do. I think you need to at least be willing to stand by the fact that I'm the one putting this out because I just think like any fight to just put out a blindsided attack with no way to respond back to you, I don't think is fair, even if the guys are rightfully guilty. And most of these sites are posting guys that I know for a fact have been involved in this stuff, but I still think it's important to have that door of communication open. And like you said, it, it makes sure that you're above reproach too. Like people can look into me and they can be they can be upset about things I do, but at least they actually know I do them. <laughs> when we did the podcast that we brought up the accounts, I think Randy said this, and this is something we all agreed with. If you're saying stupid stuff and it gets put online yeah. and, and you get busted in the chops about it, then that's your fault. Change the stupid stuff right. you're saying. I mean, <laughs> you right. know, so, exactly. I mean, I would have never been on that thing until the two podcasts got a few clips or whatever the case may be. And, it was funny because right. when he clipped us, he, he didn't cut it off soon enough. And I actually, I said what he probably didn't want me to say, which was uh, not advantageous to him and or him or her. I don't know who it is. But anyway, it is what it is. <laughs> Just as we wrap up here, I have two more questions. So I couldn't help but notice you guys don't share a lot of my content. <laughs> and I was hurt. I was heartbroken over it. But no, I'm just curious. I, I talked to Andy about this a little bit in our call, but 
what would it, you said that there is some value to what's being said and there's a place and things like that. What would it take for you as a pastor to openly support the mission of, say, a Preacher Boys or fill in the blank with any organization that's doing something similar? Is there a hesitancy there to endorse the kind of stuff that I'm doing? What I would ask first is, Eric, I would like to, for you to tell me exactly what is your mission with what you're doing. Simply put, my mission is to shed light on physical, sexual, and mental abuse within the independent Baptist movement. That's At the end of the day, that's my bare bones mission. As I've done the show, my goal has been to, yes, expose it, but then also it started becoming bringing people on who can help people who have been victims of abuse to recover. So people who are uh, in fields of therapy, trauma therapy, things like that. And also now working really on preventing. So bringing on people who work with law enforcement and things like that to talk about how to avoid it. But for me, baseline is I, I look into the movement. I grew up in it. I know way too many people that I'm comfortable with who've been involved in these kind of cases. And I just want to shine a huge spotlight on it so that it can be fixed. And so that's my mission at the end of the day. Yeah. And I'll say this. is like I said earlier, I, I honestly have no problem. I, I really guess you could say in a lot of ways I do support you documenting the cases that you, where you cite victims. I have listened to some of the stories. I turn my, they turn my st- – and they absolutely ripped my heart out. I, I appreciate the fact you're naming perpetrators. The only time I ever took issue with anything was, was with, and it may be I didn't listen. Maybe I only caught the, the episodes where it seemed like when you would mention the abuse, it was in a broad brushing type term. So because hmm. of the egregiousness of what you're talking about, I, I do appreciate whenever you are case specific and when you highlight the right. facts and whenever you stay away from generalizations and because here's my thing again whenever they're guilty hey call it out that's what i believe is going to change the culture and and as long as you're willing to do this and i think you probably are i understand that your main focus is the ifb because you have friends and you have experience there yeah um as long as you're i don't know what denomination or what group you're with now but as long as you're practicing matthew 7 and that you're always when the call it out amongst the closeness that you're associated with, because it, wherever yeah. you're at, it's going to be there too. It's yeah. going to be, it's in everything, Eric. And the reason I say that, and I'm just saying because it is, we should just leave it alone. We should deal with it. Uh, yeah. But it's everywhere sure. because people, yeah, I'm assuming that you're doing this, but it's, you know, your podcast is, is a person giving their story, an opportunity that they're telling their story. And I'm hoping that you're reaching out and at least giving the other side an opportunity to tell their story as well. Because there's, Solomon said, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter or whatever. Now, when I say that, I'm saying this. That means that the other side hopefully is aware that they're being accused, and most of the time they are, but then right. give them a chance. If they want to respond, uh, either there needs to – hopefully they've got some legal counsel involved there or, or there's – sadly, there could be some guilt there. Yeah, it's it's important. It's been diff it's been different with my show because typically they've already been accused publicly, and so they expound on it. But yeah, it's definitely important. And again, like I said, that's why it's important to have a name on it because everybody. I open every show with a disclaimer: everybody's innocent until proven guilty. But silence does speak volumes. Uh, so I, I I guess I just want to ask one more question: What would you like to see? You mentioned the new generation of IFB of which you're a part, and now there's even a a generation of even younger pastors in their 20s and getting ready, leaving Bible college, starting churches, independent Baptist churches. I guess what would be your hopes for the IFB movement as it moves forward into the future? Um, That's a great question, too. I'll say this. I I think, and I hope it's already happening. I know it is with the guys I'm close to, but but I'll, I'll bullet point a few things. Number one, a return to biblical exposition of the scriptures. I'm hoping in days to come that the reading of a text and departing, I'm hoping that's departing. <laughs> in other words, hope it goes away. I, I'm, yeah. I, I hope so. I hope because when guys get to preaching the Bible, things get straightened out in church when they get really going through it expositionally. That's number one. Number two, I would say an embracing of principles over heroes. Mm-hmm. It's something that I think will happen more and more as we move forward, and I'm praying and hoping that it does. Hopefully an abandonment of showmanship in the pulpit. And I think yeah. this is probably more East Coast than West Coast, I would assume, because on the East Coast, we're, 
it's it's very common uh, around the southern culture of independent Baptist church especially where there are certain circles where you know, certain kinds of meetings are where there's a lot of showmanship i hope that ends or at least gets to be very far and few between and then lastly i'd say this eric for fundamentalism the next generation it, it's a brand new era we have wow. sat back now and we believe we are hearing more and more about the mistakes of yesteryear and some of them that are still even happening today and I really hope there becomes a healthy disdain for it in my day and time, and we write our own story differently. That's my prayer. That's my hope. I want to be one of the guys that helps that happen And because if we don't make a change now, the next generation that comes behind us will still be fighting these battles or worse. No, I think it's important, and there is a, there's a big increase in awareness, and I think a lot of that's just we live in that Internet age, and so closed-door meetings – don't stay closed door, things that happen in a town, don't stay in a town. And I I think it's actually a good thing because I think a lot of pastors who got comfortable in the 70s and 80s with the ability to just shuffle things around are now facing a generation of smartphones and podcasts. And I think there's a lot of responsibility there. There's responsibility to look into things and to make sure that, and to make sure that you cover things the right way. But I think it's a good time. I think it's a good time. It's going to shine a light where it needs to be shined. But uh, but I, I appreciate you. I know we went a little bit long, but I appreciate you hopping on and talking about this. And like I said, the, at the end of the day, we'll probably walk away and there's still things that we, we disagree with. But I think it's important to have these conversations. And I hope, if nothing else, for people listening, whether you're someone who finds yourself as maybe someone who's who feels extremely hurt by the church and you're you're passionate like I am about exposing this kind of stuff or whether you're a staunch IFP pastor who's listening to the show and trying to figure out what the motive is here I hope if nothing else that this episode shows that you can sit down for an hour and have a conversation with two parties that can be kind and amicable and really I think the only way we're going to get closer to the truth is by talking about it and by, by sharing and, and learning different perspectives and really trying to understand where each other are coming from. I appreciate you coming on the show and, and for taking so much time. I know it's a little bit later in your time zone, so I appreciate you making the effort to be on this call with me today. No problem, Eric. I really appreciate the opportunity, and I thank you again for being a very kind and gracious host. Thanks so much. Can you just let people know really quick before before we hang up? Can you just let them know where they can find you, whether on social and obviously through the podcast? Yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter at the my handle is at Lighthouse B A P T three, and and then of course our church is Lighthouse Baptist Church um, in Seagrove. Our website lbcseagrove.com, and that's Seagrove S E A G R O V E. And uh, then, of course, me and my wife have a combined account on Facebook as well. And that's uh, the easiest way to find me. Thanks again for coming on. I'll let you go because I know it's a little bit later. But thank you so much again for, for sharing with us. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Oh, that's a chair we used to do in softball. Uh, what? It's, uh, actually Geico's. Whenever someone hit a triple, we would wave our bats and yell, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. But we never got to use it because we would only hit home runs. Annoying. The phrase is from Geico because they help save people money. Geico? Yeah, they were our team sponsor. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Now more than ever, it's important for you and your family to enjoy the spaces you're in most often. Visit fergusonshowrooms.com to shop online or schedule a personalized consultation to meet with our experts at your local Ferguson bath, kitchen, and lighting gallery. Together, we'll help you make the most of home and create a space you'll love to live in. Get started on your project and discover extraordinary products like the Arizo Chandelier from Progress Lighting.